fairly certain that neither Israel nor Palestine is going to move very soon on who really gets the territory of Palestine. And I was, and it seems like each deserves their own homeland. So I was wondering what you thought was the fairest way to settle the differences between the Israelis and the Palestinians. I think they should adopt the Arab peace initiative. I think it is the most equitable uh, uh, and uh, just uh, <coughs> end game for uh, the Palestinians and the, and the Israelis. And what it basically says, as I mentioned in my, in my presentation, is that in return for, for the land that Israel occupied on June 4th, 1967, um, and having uh, East Jerusalem as, as, as capital of Palestine, and a mutually agreed to uh, resolution for the refugee problem, the Palestinian refugee problem, then Israel will, will, will get full Arab and, and Muslim recognition, full relations, and full uh, normalization and end of, of, uh, of hostility. And I don't think anybody can, anymore can doubt that this territorial compromise between these two conflicting uh, causes uh, is the end, uh, the end goal, and should be the end goal. Uh, because uh, uh, having a viable Palestinian state next to, to Israel, in my view, is the only assurance for the security of, uh, of Israel. And having an Israel that is secure is, by having the state next to it, is the only assurance that the Palestinians will continue to have a land that they can call their own. So uh, the two-state solution and uh, the, any formulas that come out of that, in my view, the Arab Peace Initiative being the best one, is, I think, the fairest and the most just. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Because of um, um, my looking at the United Nations issues, I wondered uh, also, as you were the ambassador to the U.S., uh, and wondered what the pressing issues were at that time, and if you have seen any progress on those issues uh, since then, or uh, are those the same issues uh, today? When I came as ambassador, it was September uh, 2005, and uh, the number of Saudi students in the United States as a result of September 11, 2001, had gone down dramatically from uh, September 2001. There were more than, I think, 7,500 Saudi students in the United States. By September 2005, they were down to 2,000. 2,100 or so. Uh, and one of the most, uh, uh, I think, successful uh, and very gratifying uh, improvements in the relationship between our two countries has been the, uh, the King Abdullah Scholarship Program for Saudi students uh, everywhere, but particularly in this country. Because from 2005, September, to 2011, uh, September, the, the number jumped from 2,000 to more than 40,000. So <coughs> you can imagine the scale of the, of the improvement. Uh, another improvement, of course, was in the uh, issuance of visas. Uh, since uh, I left my post in 2007, uh, Saudis now uh, have only to wait two weeks before a visa is issued. And uh, depending on the category of their, of their visit, they can have up to five years, multiple uh, entry visas. Uh, uh, exchange in terms of, 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 of business and finance and so on uh, have simply uh, grown uh, exponentially uh, since uh, 2005, 2007. So all of these things have been, have been very, very positive. Um, and uh, American investment is and has always been traditionally the largest in Saudi Arabia from any other country. Uh, and the kingdom is also uh, America's largest trading partner in the Middle East. So these uh, have continued to be um, uh, clear landmarks in, in how well this is the, uh, the relationship between us. We still disagree about Palestine. Uh, 
Um, and I think there is a disagreement over Iraq as well. Uh, not in the sense that we disagree that America is pulling out her troops. That is between Americans and, and Iraqis to decide. But the whole Iraqi invasion and subsequent developments and so on uh, have been done with, with us being on, on, on different points of view. That remains. Uh, it hasn't gone away. Um, we disagreed, for example, on, on what happened uh, in Egypt with the, with the fall of President Mubarak. Uh, if you remember uh, with me, uh, I hate to remember unhappy occasions, but now you bring them to mind, I have to mention it. Um, the, uh, when uh, Ms. Clinton was asked a week before uh, President Clinton reversed her saying about, uh, about Mr. Mr. Mubarak. He said, no, no, we have full confidence in him, etc. This is going back to January 2011. Uh, and when the next demonstration went out in the streets and, and grew in number, uh, the president made the statement, or his spokesman made the statement, uh, what do you mean by, by, Amer by Mubarak has to leave? Uh, the, the, the spokesman said, well, he has to leave tomorrow. The understanding before that was that it was left to what happens between the president and his people. Uh, and that, of course, elicited an immediate response from our king. Why interfere? And he let the course of events stay, take, take its, its place and, and let the Egyptians decide, not, not you. They had a heated conversation on, on, on the telephone. But we have a very strategic relationship with the United States. So, where we choose to differ with each other, we tell each other. We don't hide it. And the king did not hide his disappointment in what President Obama said. Uh, nor did the president hide the fact that he said it. <laughs> he, did, he said so in public. Yeah. So it's that kind of relationship. Uh, one thing I would just remind you of, uh, in my presentation of, of my, of my a copy of my, my, uh, my credentials as ambassador to Secretary Rice in, in, in New York in 2005 before presenting them to the president. Uh, I reminded her of a story related to, to uh, the late uh, Winston Churchill with the late uh, Franklin Roosevelt at the White House during the Second World War. When um, uh, Roosevelt, to show his appreciation of, of Churchill, invited him to stay at the White House, not at Blair House. So uh, one evening when Roosevelt wanted to go see Mr. Churchill, he opened the door to his room and he found Mr. Churchill stark naked in the bedroom. So Roosevelt started to wheel back on his wheelchair and Churchill turned to him very coolly and said, Mr. President, the Prime Minister of England has nothing to hide from the President of England. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I said to, to, uh, to the, the secretary, that's the kind of relationship I'd like to have with, with America. <laughs> uh, this is not a comment, it's a question. Uh, I, you probably can tell I'm from Pakistan. And uh, lately Pakistan has become the incubator of terrorism. You know, you want to find a terrorist, and it's a grand central station. It's there, and the zip code is going to be somewhere in the western frontier province. There's some consensus, consensus of opinion on the streets in Pakistan that uh, a lot of the ideology and the funding for this terrorism emanates from the Middle East, and maybe from Saudi Arabia. I'm not saying from the government, but maybe from the population of the people. I was wondering what you have to say to that, and what the Saudi government is doing to, to counteract that. I think the accusation is there. I think it's unfair, uh, and I'll tell you why. Uh, because I think if there is anybody to blame on, on, on where this kind of, of nihilist, uh, uh, terrorist, uh, extremist uh, ideology came about, it came about from everywhere. Uh, you can identify Saudis who promoted it. You can also identify Pakistanis who promoted it. You can identify Egyptians and Jordanians and so on. So I would say that it did not emanate from Saudi Arabia. And as I said, the kingdom has been a victim of all of these uh, terrorist uh, attitudes and uh, intentions. Uh, and
And what the kingdom has done is to forcefully uh, challenge these, uh, these terrorists and share our experience with others if they can see value in it. So our rehabilitation program, for example, has been uh, well studied by other countries to see if it applies to them. And I'm sure we received many uh, Pakistani experts uh, who looked at this program to see if it could be applied uh, in, uh, in, in Pakistan. Um, as, as someone who, who was in, in intelligence as these groups were in formation, if you like, the 80s and 90s and so on, um, I can tell you that, uh, that the, the, the responsibility is global. Uh, and I, you can't pinpoint one country or one individual or one group of, of people as being responsible. I think it is more than just, than just that. It was a general attitude that uh, we in the intelligence services in the 80s and 90s, and I've said this in public before, simply um, blinked our eyes uh, at that issue and did not identify it as, as a potential danger that it became. We had our eyes more open and more concentrated on ex-Soviet supported uh, terrorist groups in Europe like the Bader Meinhof group in Germany or the Red Brigades in Italy or the Basque uh, ETA groups, or among the Palestinians, the George Habash, Naif Hawatma, Abu Nidal uh, groups that were bedeviling us in the 60s and, and, and 70s. And we sort of missed the, the, the boat on, on, on these religious uh, aspiring uh, groups uh, that, that were growing uh, at that time, whether in Sudan or in Afghanistan or perhaps in Saudi Arabia. One of the biggest emanators of such philosophy in the 90s, particularly, uh, was London. Uh, and you remember the term Londonistan uh, was very prevalent in those, in those years where London acted as a host to many of these people who were either uh, fleeing from persecution in countries like Saudi Arabia or in Pakistan or in Egypt and so on. So uh, I would say that it was a collective responsibility and not the Saudis. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>